Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the JBBC Virtual Biz Zone. This morning, we have the third and final in our women, Women's Entrepreneur Series. My name is Sansia Campbell, and I'm the Public Relations and Events Coordinator here at the Jamaica Business Development Corporation. Now, we've been having some really exciting presenters and presentations over the past two weeks. If you remember in week one, which was the was International Women's Day, we had um, Scotia Bank, and they were talking about advancing women and advancing business. Last week we had Barita Foundation, and she talked about creating wealth, taking stock, meeting return on investment, ensuring that you make those right investments so that you can earn the right amounts of money that you need to be earning on those investments that you are making. Now, this morning, we are doing something that is unusual because it's a business seminar, it's a business webinar, but we wanted to go outside of the box for our women, our women entrepreneurs, because I think it is so important for us to look at the entrepreneur as a whole. And so we have partnered with the Jamaica Constabulary Force. And I am so, so excited. I don't know if I've ever been excited for any other presentation as I am for this particular one, because we have with us the face of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, who is Detective Corporal Sasha Gay Mullings. I, look here, I've been telling her from last week how I'm excited. She must have said, what weird. I don't understand why this lady is so excited, but I'm so excited to have her because it is so important for us as women in particular to learn to take care of ourselves, to secure ourselves, our surroundings, and everything that concerns us. And so this morning, Detective Corporal Mullins is going to talk to us about securing the bag, securing the business, and of course, securing you. Right Before I introduce Detective Corporal Mullings, so I want to remind you that the session is being recorded and it will be available on the JBBC YouTube channel. So when you get a chance, just click subscribe. So if you can't stay with us for the entire presentation, we'll understand, but you can always go back to it and take a look at it. Also, you'll be able to access all the other presentations that we have done so far. Additionally, um, if you have colleagues that were not able to join us this morning, you can always direct them to the YouTube channel and they will be able to find the video there. So let me tell you a little bit about Detective Corporal Sasha Gay Mullings. She is a woman with a bubbly personality. She's from humble beginnings and was born and raised in the cool parish of Manchester. She attended the Villa Road Primary and Junior High School and Manchester High School. She's very athletic. And so it is no surprise that she represented her school in track and field as well as netball. She spent six years in accounting and then realized her passion for investigation. She enlisted in the JCF in April, 2013, where she excelled and made her mark even in training. She was the coveted number one class captain and student council treasurer. She also capped awards such as best speaker for all debate matches, as well as best all rounder. She garnered the knowledge for general policing while working at the Halfway Tree Police Station. Nine months later, she was transferred to the corporate communications unit at the commissioner's office. Even whilst there, it was as if she was a seasoned investigator as she asked pertinent questions when gathering information. It is with this interest that she taught the detective training courses and was appointed detective in 2020. So while we were battling COVID, Detective Corporal Mullins was stepping up the game, leveling up, right? So she's an all-rounder and she's very security conscious and is a captain of the Super Six an all-female shooting team that is creating quite a stir in the sport of shooting. She's not yet a mother. However, she's a strict but fun aunt to four beautiful nieces whom she adores and the mother of her little brother whom she also loves dearly. She is the third of five children for her mom. 
So ladies, it gives me great and a distinct pleasure as well to introduce to you Detective Corporal Sasha Gay Mullings. And she's going to be sharing with us about securing the bag, securing the business and securing you. Over to you, Detective Corporal Mullings. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for that beautiful introdu introduction, Ms. Campbell. Um, I remember somebody saying earlier, they tried to find something about me on the internet. <laughs> I see you found something. Um, thank you so much. And welcome to everyone in the room. Good morning to both men and women. I'm sure we probably have some men who are assisting with the technical areas of this webinar. And so I wanna say thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me and I expect this to be an interactive session because when we talk about security, we want to learn about other person's experiences and so we can take things from there. So this morning, we're gonna be talking about securing the bag, the business and you. And if you notice on your screen, I have you in all caps. And that is because you're the most important asset as it relates to anything at all. If you cannot secure yourself, then you cannot secure your bag and you cannot secure your business. Now, one of the first things I want to bring across to you is personal safety. Practice awareness. And by this, I mean, awareness is your first line of defense, right? So awareness of yourself, your surroundings and your potential attackers likely strategies. So as it relates to yourself, like I always tell people, the way you walk, the way you attire yourself, the way you, you conduct yourself, it tells a lot. So if you appear as if you're timid and you're afraid, then you become a soft target to criminal elements. Be aware of your surroundings. You're walking in a crowded area, for example, you might want to look out for persons who might be following you. You might be seeing somebody just recently. I think it was on Sunday, I went to a, a, a business place and there was this man inside the business place. Every single aisle that I went into, the man was there. It's either he walked past me or he was behind me or something, but we're always um, coming in contact. And I felt a little way about it because I'm very security conscious. So of course I sent a friend a message to say, hey, I'm at X place and there's this man, everywhere I go, I'm, I'm running into him. Every aisle I go into, I'm running into him. I also went to the security guards who were at the entrance to the business place and I said, does this place have covert security? And the person said, what do you mean? I said, do you have undercover security guards there? And they said, yes. I said, is he wearing a red cap? And they said, yes. I said, okay. But I still didn't feel comfortable. I went to the cashier and the man came to the front and he stood there and he watched me the entire time. But I still ended up asking the cashier if that man is actually a security guard there. And that's one other thing as well. You cannot let persons be aware that you're actually watching them because it will make them move more speedily because they think that, hey, you probably called somebody or you probably realize you're gonna be attacked and so on. So you want to not let them, you don't, you don't want to arouse their suspicion, put it that way, right? So just be aware of your surroundings and who might be following you, things that are unusual that might be happening in your area, you want to be aware of that. You also want to be aware if there are certain crimes that are on the rise in your community, for example. If there is an increase in robberies, if there is an increase, and you have access to this information, the JCF website has information and, and statistics on robberies and so on, as well as you build relationships with your local police. And you can always be in touch with them to gather information if you need to. 
be aware of your potential attackers likely strategies and their strategy is always to surprise you they want to do something to you they want to attack you when you least expect it right so you want to always tell yourself that you're likely to be attacked if you do this or if you do that right never leave the primary crime scene so never you get into a car that your attacker is trying to force you into or go down some alley that your attacker is trying to force you to walk down to with them the primary crime scene is very important that you try as best as possible to alert persons whilst you're there. Trust your instinct. You know, Jamaicans always say, my sixth sense tells me this, or my sixth sense tells me that. Trust your instinct. If you, if you are uncomfortable about someone or about something, chances are your instinct is correct and there is some form of danger. So always alert somebody, trust your instinct, don't go anywhere with that person. All right, so another thing that we need to talk about is safeguarding against home invasion. How do we secure our homes? So I remember, again, I have a lot of memories. Maybe that's why I went into policing and investigation. Um, my mom was robbed when I was about 10 years old. And the person who robbed her hid behind some plants that were called Joseph coats at the time. The person laid in the jo Joseph coat and they did not move until my mom got home and was trying to open the gate. That's when they pounced on her and they got her bag and stuff. So cut shrubs that are around your home. Anything, any plant that is too big, that hides lighting that persons are able to hide behind or hide within, you try to get rid of those plants. Try to keep modest, um, smaller plants that persons are not able to hide. Keep your yard well lit. Criminal elements are less likely to pounce on you if your area is well lit. And if you're going home and you notice that you usually have lights with sensors that comes on when it gets dark. If you're driving up to your house and you realize that your lights are not on, likely something is wrong. Because I've seen incidents where persons go and unscrew the bulbs from persons um, sensor lights. So when they get home, they get a chance to rob them. And the neighbors saw these persons, but the neighbors said, that they called to them and they said they were from a cable company and that they were checking on something. So the neighbor did not alert their, um, their neighbor. And of course, when they got home, they were punched upon by gunmen and they were robbed of their motor vehicle. So we have to be careful of things like those. You have to be aware of your surroundings, as I said earlier, and you have to pay attention to the minute details when you're going home or anywhere at all that you are. Always keep doors locked. So we keep doors locked. We don't invite persons into our homes that we don't know. If they approach you and they're saying that they need some assistance, you can talk to them through, through a window or, or through a little hole <laughs> that they don't have to have access to your premises. So you can ask them, is there somebody you want me to call for you? And you can call the person for them. If it is that they're saying they're from JPS or NWC or Digicel or whatever network, it doesn't matter. We don't let them into our homes unless you were expecting somebody as also we verify because you can contact these agencies to verify whether or not they sent a technician by whatever name to your premises to check on, on whatever challenge you're having. A dog is a great security, and I don't mean poodles and those house dogs, even though some of them really alert you if there's an intruder. But investing in a really nice dog that is able to alert you when somebody or something strange is happening at your home 
is a very good investment. Get an electric alarm system as well. It never hurts. I've been a victim of house breaking and it was at the time I least expected it because it was COVID time, COVID just started. I remember my office shutting down. We were working from home and we worked from home for like two weeks initially. And even after we got clearance, we still, we were still working from home. So I was at home three full weeks, not going anywhere. Everything was delivered and so on. And the one day I decided to go to the gym, I left the home, I left the house at 8 a.m. And when I got back around 11, my house was broken into and jewelry and stuff were gone. So we have to, and I ended up investing, even though it was an additional expense I wish I didn't have, I ended up investing in an electric alarm system. Another great thing for women to do is to call home before arriving. And that's really if you have somebody else at home. So if the gate needs to be opened, if there's a grill to be opened, um, maybe you're traveling with things that you need to remove from your car and so on, it's highly unlikely that somebody will attack you when you have company. So you call home ahead of time so that by the time you get there, your household members are expecting you and they're out and about awaiting your arrival and assisting you. Um, sometimes too, what I do is to drive past my house. So I drive past my house and then I return just to ensure I'm not being followed. I go in a cul-de-sac, I make a U-turn, I do all kinds of craziness just to ensure I'm not being followed. Shred documents with contact and sensitive information before disposing. And this is very important because a lot of times as business owners too, you're gonna have a lot of confidential information that you handle daily pertaining to yourself and your business. You don't want that to get into the wrong hands. So shred those documents. Don't just tear them and put them into the trash can. Because one of the things, even as investigators that we do, one of the things that can help you solve a lot of crimes is going through somebody's trash. Because we can put those little pieces of paper back together like a, a, a puzzle, you know? So it's very good not to um, dispose of your documents like that, but to shred them before you dispose of them. This is one of my key things, limit social media content. And this is really as it relates to your personal lives, right? Do not be posting everywhere you go, when you go there, the time you leave, what you ate, what you are wearing. And most people do this while they're still at the location. That is the red flag, right? Don't post your location whilst you're there. If you really wish to post, it's best to post when you leave the location. So you can post a day later as a flashback or even letting people think that you're there now, but you already left a week ago. When we travel, a lot of us love to indicate that we're traveling as well. So we'll post something on social media to say, you're at the airport or you're posting your, your, your passport and your, your flight pass and so on. You don't want to do that, right? So limit your social media content. How do you secure yourself on the road? How do you avoid carjacking? How, is there anybody in the room that has ever been carjacked or was there an attempt of a carjacking? Maybe not, but how do we avoid, avoid carjacking? So one, we need to be more observant, right? So earlier I mentioned, be aware of your surroundings and what is happening around you, right? So you want to ensure you're not being followed, and stuff like that. So keep your doors locked. So once I go into my vehicle, I click the lock button. Before I even start my vehicle, I click the lock button. So a lot of times persons might 
want to just hang around your vehicle and as they see you going into your vehicle, they want to jump right in behind you. No, we didn't go out together. So who are you, sir or ma'am? And women do it too, right? So just be careful. As you go into your car, you press that lock button, lock your doors, then you proceed to starting your vehicle or removing your bag and so on and putting it um, elsewhere. Be deliberate. So for me, I'm a trained defensive driver for the JCF that is. So there are things that I learned whilst on that course that I'm gonna share a bit with you. So I might go into my car, I know that I'm gonna turn left on a particular road. Instead of indicating a mile down the road that I'm gonna turn left, even though it's not good practice, especially if you're being followed closely, you might have other road users who might bump into your back and so on. I'll just make a sudden left turn without indicating. That is defensive driving. Or I'll sit at the stoplight, allow it to change more than once <laughs> before I move off, just to check if I'm being followed. If you're not being followed, chances are the person behind you might be tooting their horn to say, hey, why is it that you didn't move when the light changed to green? The light was on green, why is it that you didn't move? But you, I do a lot of things just to ensure my security is paramount. I'm very deliberate when I'm on the roadway. I observe a lot. I check my mirrors very regularly, just like somebody is, it, people say I'm paranoid, but I check my mirrors very regularly. So you should check your mirrors just to ensure that you're not being followed and so on. Tins and windows, even though in Jamaica, as it relates to public transportation, they really don't want persons to have tinted windows but that's really for public transportation. So I try to tint my windows so not, nobody can see in, inside my vehicle for, to see something that will alarm them or, or that will intrigue them into breaking into my car or trying to get to that um, particular thing. And some of us too, we have a bad habit of having cash in our doors in our door arms or armrest area that is open and places like that that persons can easily see you don't want to leave cash and valuables inside your vehicle especially where it can be seen give sufficient space in traffic to allow for quick maneuvering so if it is that something is happening in front of you or behind you and you need to change your route quickly you want to give enough space. So if you need to make a U-turn or a sudden left turn or a right turn, then you're able to do so without bumping into someone else. If it is that you're being approached by somebody and you feel uncomfortable, you feel threatened, then you'll have enough space to move your vehicle as opposed to if you were sitting bumper to bumper um, in traffic, then you wouldn't have any space to respond if you feel that your life is under threat. As I said before, be aware of vehicles behind you. And if you think you're being followed, try to contact somebody, drive to a public area, drive to a police station. Do not go to the location you initially planned on going to. So if you were going home, do not go to your house because you, you will lead that person, even if it is that they don't attack you at that point. What they'll probably do is to leave, go around the road, probably come back another day because they'll know your address now. So what I advise is for persons to drive to a well-lit public area, very busy area, or to drive to a police station to ask for some assistance because you think you're being followed. If you're able, to ascertain the registration plate of the vehicle that you think is following you, then you can do so and also provide that information to the police so that they can do some checks on it. Stay alert, stay off the phone, use an earpiece. And it is 
modern time now, every phone comes with an earpiece. Every phone comes with an earpiece and every phone you're able to purchase AirPods now. So you don't have to have that um, telephone cord running from your ear to the phone and so on. So you invest in one of those. I see persons investing in um, devices that you attach to your dashboard as well. And you're able to place your phone there so you don't have to hold it in your hands. Vehicles are also being made with Bluetooth. So you can actually connect your phone to your Bluetooth and you can speak through that if you need to use the telephone at that point. Siri is very good at dialing numbers when you ask Siri to. So you can ask Siri to dial Sasha, for example. So, and you can say, Sasha, I think I'm being followed by XYZ. I'm on X road. Sasha can call the police for you and be the communicator between the police, the middle person between the police and you, and they can intercept you along the roadway. One of the things I see a lot of ladies do, and I experienced this some time ago when a woman ran the red light, she was heavily pregnant and she ran the red light and you know what she was doing? Applying her makeup. So we apply makeup at home, not inside the car. That is very distracting. It can lead to an accident as well as it can allow you to not be alert when you need to be. So if you're being attacked and you're there putting on your makeup, you don't see when that person is approaching you. And so it is not safe. And I ask persons to desist from putting on makeup whilst in their vehicle. Change your routes. It is very important to know multiple routes to your home, to your business, or wherever it is that you're going. Do not take the same route every day. Persons can study how you operate by checking the time you leave work, the time you pass by Burger King on Boulevard, the time you pass by whichever location, and the time you get home. So change it up a bit, right? Sometimes you go home early, sometimes you go home late. Um, take a different road home. Instead of driving Boulevard, drive probably Spanish Town Road or Perkins Boulevard, just change your routes. And it's important also to know multiple routes because if it is that you're going home and you notice you're being followed, there should be a road that you know that you can turn on because if you turn here, there are usually persons outside along the roadway or there's a police station on that road or something. So it's highly unlikely that you will be followed when you stop at a police station. And I'm gonna be sharing a little video with you and this video is about securing your bag. An elderly lady on a motorized scooter shopping at her local supermarket in Burbank, California. But check it out. There's a woman who seems to be lurking behind her. She looks around and then she snatches the purse. The victim has no idea what's just happened. Pretty outrageous. Every woman knows how vulnerable our purses and handbags can be to thieves. So we wondered what would happen if I left my purse behind at a busy location, like the original farmer's market here in Los Angeles. I casually stroll away, leaving the purse behind, as if I'd forgotten it. It doesn't get much attention until a security guard takes it away. So what happened when I went to the security office to report my purse missing? Got my purse back. So now, let's see if the money's still in it. Yep, there it is. Time for me to find our security guard and thank him for passing the honesty test. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my pleasure. You're welcome. Next, I went to the Hollywood Walk of Fame and left my purse on these steps outside the iconic Chinese theater. Check out the guy with the orange backpack. He pulls out the wallet and takes off. I think it's this way. What he doesn't know is that I've left a tracking device inside the purse. My producer and I are on his trail. It says it's on the corner of Sunset and Highland. Highland, Sunset, that way. Okay. The chase is on. He's up there, maybe. So where did the tracking there. device lead us to? The tracking device. No money, no wallet. 
but here's our GPS tracker. Next up, this parking lot in Hollywood, where I left my purse on the car. A few minutes later, these ladies stroll by. They spend a minute or two deliberating, and then they grab the purse and take off. They are three cars in front of us. Little do they know, I'm on their trail. If they were doing the right thing, they could have turned my purse into mall security. It's pretty obvious at this point, they're up to no good. We're directly behind the Honda Civic with the women inside that took my purse. They're trying to get away, but they're caught up in traffic. Time to hop out of the car. Hi there, I'm Lisa Guerrero with Inside Edition and you guys grabbed the purse off the top of my car. Where is it? Oh, there it is. It's right by your foot, actually. Can I have my purse back? Yeah. Did you take the money out of it? Did you take money out of it? Yeah. You did. You took the money out of it. And what about the tracking device? They must have spotted it because they dropped it in a cup of soda. What kind of experiment is this in the first? We're doing an honesty test and you didn't pass it. I know. You failed miserably, actually. I know. Is that the right thing to do? No, it's not the right thing to do. Nobody's perfect. Thank you so much. So. As you can see, and even though that is a US-based video, it doesn't mean that um, it doesn't happen in Jamaica. It does happen in Jamaica. If you leave your, your purse carelessly, then persons are likely to snatch it. So I want to suggest that you don't carry a bag at all, as this is the best way to prevent a thief from targeting you. However, I know that as a woman, we're likely to carry bags. And some of us are likely to carry bags that contains our entire life. Car and home keys, cash, credit cards, identification. Even some of us travel with our passports all the time and even other valuables. So you want as best as possible to limit what you carry in your bag. And I'm sure many of us do that because I've seen some women with bags that you wonder if they have their entire house inside the bag. Choose the right bag. Now, pickpocketing is another crime many women should watch out for. If a thief is going to pickpocket you, they're going to look for purses and bags that are easy to access. And by this, we mean bags with a simple flap, you must never keep your bag open. So bags with a simple flap is easy access for somebody who is trying to pick, pocket you or what we call pick your bag then. Ideally, you want to choose a bag with multiple or a two-step system to get inside. So for example, the ideal bag would be something like a bag with a zipper and also a flap that will click close. The extra steps are going to deter thieves and keep your personal belongings safe because by the time they flip that flap, <laughs> then you, it might get your attention as to who flipped your, your bag. And then by the time they're zipping, you might be onto their tail. I've had an incident in half a tree where I was traveling to Manchester from Kingston and um, I had a bag. I placed my handbag inside my weekend bag because at the time I was taking the bus. And I remember looking down because as usual, I said, I'm very aware of my surroundings. I use my, perif I use my peripheral vision a lot. So I'll pretend that I'm looking to the side but I'm really looking behind me. And I remember looking down at my bag, I felt a tug and I looked down at my bag and I saw a hand. I know it wasn't my hand. So I went in defensive mode. I gave my attacker no chance to respond and I attacked him. And this is by using empty hand control or defensive tactics to deter him and he ran off, right? But not saying you should do that because you're probably not trained to do it and you might be afraid to do it. And then when you think about it too, several things could have happened after I um, 
went into defense mode. So you want to be very careful as to what you carry and how you carry it. Be careful of how you hold your bags. So you may think holding a purse or a bag close to your body will prevent theft, but you may be surprised. Experienced thieves may be looking for a challenge and even purses that are right against your body can be easy for thieves to open. And I'm sure those of us who go to the market, those of us who travel on foot, very busy areas such as half a tree or any town centers whatsoever that has a lot of pickpockets, then you might be witnessing somebody picking somebody's bag, but you can't even say anything because that poses a danger to you. And they never work alone. They never work al alone. They always have company. So you want to be very careful as to how you expose yourself and how you carry your, your bags. So when you carry your purse, hold it directly in front of you and always hold the purse flap or opening. So I have a way when I'm carrying a cross bag, for example, I hold on to where the zipper is or I hold the strap, but I'm really holding the zipper. Be particularly careful with knapsacks and purses that you carry over the shoulder as these are often easy to open and they create little movement against your body when being opened from behind. So like I said, your bag is behind you. Somebody can easily pickpocket your bag without you even realizing you go on a bus now, you're ready to pay your taxi fare, but there is no money because it was picked from your bag while you were walking along halfway tree road and nobody could alert you because it's a day. I'm sorry, I think I got bumped okay. off. Yes, yes, you're back, great. I was gonna play the video again for them, but I'm so happy. Okay, um, I had to actually use a plug-in internet now because um, the Wi-Fi went down, but the Wi-Fi is not able to play videos. <laughs> No, the plugin is not able to play videos and I have another video coming up. So I'll drop that link inside the group as well. Please do. Will do. All right. So I was saying, and I do apologize for that technical difficulty just now. All right. So never set your bag on a chair next to you. Women can become very casual with their purses and handbags. So for example, you go to a restaurant and you place your bag on the floor or you place it on a chair next to you and you might think that is safe. It is really not safe. Somebody can just walk by and snatch your bag without even you realize it. They make their self a small target. So they might stoop, they might kneel and easily snatch your bag from the chair because you're so preoccupied. You even go to events and you sit and you put your bag on the chair next to you, but you turn your back to your bag and you're having your, a conversation with your friend who might not even be realizing that somebody just snatched your bag. By the time you turn around, there is no bag. So you have to be careful with your handbags. Some women, when they're at a store, they set their bag, bag directly in the front cart. So you know that little rise in the front of the cart. That's where a lot of women place their bags and they're perusing shelves and they're checking for items and they're checking for goods. And if they're not remembering that their bag is unattended inside the cart. So you become distracted and it becomes simple for the thief to just walk by and take your purse, right? So you want to be careful of incidents such as that. To prevent this from happening, consider placing your bag on your lap or lift up your chair, lift the leg of the chair and place the, pur the purse strap or the bag strap around the leg of the chair. Limit the amount of cash you carry. And I know you're not able to respond to me, but for the obvious reason, why should you limit the amount of cash you carry? persons are likely to pounce on you if, if they know you have cash. And even if they don't know you have cash, they're likely to pounce on you, but it's highly unlikely that they'll have access to your money if it is that you have cards or check leaves, for example. 
But if you have cash, that's 200,000, 500,000, a million dollars that they're able to make off with and go spend. So you want to secure your bag and by doing so, you secure your belongings in terms of your cash and other valuable items. How do we secure our business? So the women inside this group are business women. And so we want to give you some main tips on how you can secure your business because you might be surprised at the persons who are likely to rob you. Most times it's somebody who used to work for you or who is employed to you and they're a part of the plot and so on. So you want to learn ways and means of how you can secure your business. So one, conduct background checks on prospective employees. And by this, we mean possibly hiring an investigator who is able to go into communities that this person has listed that they live. They're able to contact persons who might know them. They're able to pull certain information from certain systems about them, financial institutions, um, schools, and so on. So you want to do a proper background check on your prospective employees. Request a police record report. And this really tells if a person has ever been convicted of a crime. Because if you, if you weren't convicted of a crime, then you wouldn't, your fingerprint would not be in the police database because we're not on mid levels yet. So we don't have access to everybody's fingerprints. But once you were convicted of a crime and the time period for expungement has not passed, then your fingerprint would be on the system as being convicted of a crime if you were ever fingerprinted. Because sometimes for some misdemeanors, they'll bypass fingerprinting or they request, some lawyers will request that their client not be fingerprinted depending on the crime, just so that you're not, you don't travel with that record because sometimes it's hard to get a job to rehabilitate and so on. So some lawyers might request that their client not be fingerprinted. But a police record report is a good way also of vetting your prospective employees. Monitor your accounts. And even though you might have an accountant, it does not mean that you are likely or you're a hard target. Sometimes these very same accountants are the persons who are pulling money from your accounts and misusing funds and so on. So when you do your taxes, they know how to fix the paperwork so that certain things do, doesn't come up and certain things does not alarm you or the tax administrators, right? So you want to monitor your accounts yourself and have a look at how and what is happening inside your business and your accounts. Limit the use of checks and utilize online transfers and direct deposits. And if you're like me, I hate going to an ATM machine. So I try to do most of my business transactions and my bill payments and so on online. I don't like going to the bank because I just think somebody is going to think I have a lot of money and be following me out of there. So limit your, the use of checks and utilize online transfers and direct deposits. Also, you're able to hire security companies that does lodgements. So for example, you have guardsmen who will come and get your cash and take it to the bank to do lodgements and so on on your behalf. And at a fee, that is, it's okay to utilize them. Police officers as well, sometimes if you have police officers or no police officers, or even just ask a random police officer to assist you to the bank, then they will do so. They're able to provide some level of security for you. Limit information you share on or through internet platforms, 
so that fishers don't get access. So you don't want to be passing around your accounting information and password and security questions and so on via email or via text messaging or any other online um, medium. You want to ensure that you secure these information, do not even save them to the system because you never know when a, when a hacker will go into your system and fish certain information from there. As I said, limit cash transactions. Utilize online as much as possible. Um, that is what it is there for. It is free of cost, so you don't have to worry about the expensive bank fees when you utilize or limit your cash transactions. Have business meetings at locations you are comfortable with. And by this, I mean at your office, if you think that is safe or a public place. Recently, I had a business transaction to do and I did not, I did not know the person. And so I chose to meet up. I didn't even want the person to know that I'm a police officer. And so I chose to meet up at a public place and I had persons in the parking lot <laughs> who were looking out for me. And I had in my earpiece, so I had in my ear pod, and I had somebody on the line who was able to listen into my conversation. So they would know if I was in danger and if I needed to. And then that person should also be somebody you trust if you're going to be having somebody online listening into your conversation. So you want to put different things in place to secure yourself and to secure your business. Invest in security cameras. After I became a victim of housebreaking, I installed security cameras and they were not that expensive because there are some now that you can download an app on your phone and you're able to see what is happening whilst you're not there. If it is that somebody is there, you can actually speak into the app and they can hear you from wherever the camera is. So you want to invest in security cameras. It has memory cards and you're able to rewind. You're able to zoom in and out and to change the direction of the camera and so on. So you have some that are very simple and easy to use and they're very inexpensive. Invest in alarm systems as well. On your buildings, as also include panic systems. These are added expenses we know, but over time it works out best for you because it's better to have it and don't need it than to need it and don't have it. And so even for me, I say test them regularly. When I installed King Alarm after the breaking, there were days, and I hope there's nobody from King Alarm that's listening to me right now, but there were times when I'd press the panic button just to check if it's working. And what I do, I press it, I'll be at home at night and I'll press it and they'll be calling my phone and I don't answer because I want to check their response time as well. So I, watch them come into, inside the yard and I watch them going around the house and so on. And then they'll call again to say a panic, the panic system went off and they responded. However, they didn't get an answer and they dispatched the team. And so the team came and everything seemed okay and so on. So sometimes what I do, I return the call in the morning and I say, oh, you know, I probably just rolled over. <laughs> on the panic system and it went off. But really and truly, and this is between us, I was only checking if the system worked and their response time. Because you know, sometimes you hire these companies to respond and they'll put on their, their contract that they'll respond within five minutes, for example, or they'll respond within 10 minutes and you press that panic system and they take half an hour to get to you. Why did it take half an hour? 
you're using motorcycles, for example. So you look at the medium of travel, um, their response time, and so on. And you use that to make an assessment of what if this happens, what will I do? How will I respond? Because you don't want to say, yes, I'm comfortable having a security system in place, but it does not work for you. And not saying you should do this because when I get home, I'll probably walk around my house before I go inside, just check my windows, check my doors and so on. And so not saying you should do that because you're probably not in a position to defend yourself if there is actually something happening there. But as I said, there are other systems you can put in place, motion systems where an alarm will go off if it is that there is somebody moving in your backyard, for example, and you're not aware of anybody being there. So you want to put systems in place to protect yourself and to protect your business. In time, Detective Corporal Mulling in the chat is asking if the police escort service is free. It definitely is free. <laughs> really? Yes. It definitely is free. Not saying you should overuse it now because you know that this depends on resources availability. But no police officer should really charge you to accompany you to the bank if it is that you feel unsafe or if it is that you feel that you need the assistance of the police. Another comment here. I'm a little concerned about the police call from those security company. What if they call and a criminal, criminal is in the house or workplace and the victim has to respond to the call as if nothing is wrong? Okay, so with the security system, there's also a response system where they will give you a code, for example, that you press if it is that you need to alert them without them calling. So for example, they'll tell you to put in, and this is just a random number, um, one, two, three, four as your code, if it is that somebody is forcing you to put in your code. So you can either do that or you're able to press one button if you need to do so quickly and yeah. they'll respond without calling your phone. I'm seeing where somebody is saying, be careful not to do this often because they'll be like the boy who cry wolf. The security companies also provide escort for you to ensure you get home and inside the house safely. And that is so correct, Mrs. Dunkley Smith, because I've had an incident as well where I actually called them to escort me home because um, it was really, really late and I didn't feel safe at the time. I was initially very paranoid after the whole breaking, and so I utilized them. I think it was only once that I utilized them and it was only once or twice that I tested the panic button. <laughs> My name is Craig Ingstrom and I'm the co-owner of Covert Investigative Services, a full service private investigation company in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. American businesses as well as businesses around the world, no matter how big or small they are, suffer from employee theft greatly, even up to bankruptcy. Employee theft is a very big and important topic. This is why we have divided it into two parts. In this video, we will look at the signs of employee theft. And in the second video, we will talk about how you might mitigate employee theft. So business owners and employers, listen very carefully because we are about to reveal the primary signs of employees stealing from you. This is advice that we are going to share with you that comes from about 35 years of experience in the industry. First of all, let's make it clear. Employee theft is not only about stealing cash or products. It also includes theft of information, theft of clients, and theft of knowledge of processes. Second of all, stealing money does not only mean opening the cash register and taking money from it. There are various ways to steal, like setting up false vendor accounts, toying with checks and bookkeeping, and flat out stealing products. All right, so let's get into the nuts and bolts of what you should be looking for and when you should start worrying. The first and most common type of employee theft is time theft, which means spending time during the work days on personal needs apart from work responsibilities. So employees that seem less productive than other employees probably are wasting time and you should be looking into that. 
So, if your employee does not have enough time to do simple tasks during the day with no reasonable explanation, it probably is a sign of time theft. Do you really want to pay for that? You can also look for things like variances in schedules, such as one driver taking longer than all other drivers on a similar route or similar length or volume of product. The next thing you should be looking for and when you should start worrying about theft is if you see shrinkage of cash in the register or shrinking of inventory of the products that you have in stock. It may happen either because of employees stealing cash from the uh, register, over-the-counter products, stealing things out the back door, or problems with businesses and suppliers. So be sure to have a thorough system to count and control your assets. The next and maybe one of the most obvious signs that your employees might be taking advantage of your business is their excessive spending. You need to be attentive to whether or not your employees' vehicles or clothes are consistent with their level of income. Let's say if your salesperson makes roughly $13 per hour, but then all of a sudden starts driving a really fancy car, it's probably time that you start to get a little suspicious. This is why knowing your employees and their associations, family background, isn't just a matter of good business management principle. It's also an effective way to know when something just isn't looking right in their lifestyle. The next sign you might want to be looking for is whether or not your business starts losing clients, especially those clients that have been with you for a long time, or for example, you start making less money from those accounts uh, and you have no reasonable explanation as to why. Of course, it might not be just a matter of your employees stealing from you. Knowing what your competitors are doing, perhaps with your own surveillance, can help you to identify whether or not you need to run countermeasures to identify if you have a mole. Of course, your employees could be setting up their own business to compete against yours. As we point out in the next video, you should protect yourself with a good contract. But you also need to be able to identify problems before they become, well, a problem. Next, and as a logical continuation of the previous point, if you start losing your clientele, you should monitor the activity of your ex-employees as well. They can open their own businesses or obviously work for your competitors and therefore share with them your knowledge of processes or even just take with them your clients. And this is illegal, especially if you have a non-compete clause, which we'll talk about in the next video. In conclusion, we wanted to remind you that the signs that we gave you before are not 100% evidence of employee theft. But if you've noticed any of these signs in your business, it might be worth checking. In our next video, I'll discuss what steps you can take to protect yourself from employee theft. Thank you so much. And this is one of the reasons too why a lot of businesses ask persons, even at my unit, because we, as communicators for the JCF, we have to sign a contract that allows us not to share certain information because we handle very confidential information at my unit. And so a lot of companies employ that method. And if it is that persons take your information elsewhere, then they can be sued. So that's a step you can also take to protect your information for your business. I was going to, through the chat and I saw where someone asked the question earlier in the presentation about the person who may be following you and you not alerting them. It is important not to, you're, you're, you're probably, you were asking if it is not important to probably alert them so that they'll know that you know you're being followed. No, it doesn't always work out well that way because as I said, they might be working with other persons. And so you don't want them to pounce on you at that point, unless it is a very busy area and somewhere that you think other persons might come to your defense, which is almost unlikely because even my incident in halfway tree, when I was, when I went in defensive mode, everybody froze and they wanted me to kill a man, but nobody was helping me to defend myself or my belongings. And so you want to be careful of alerting them at that point. Also, um, I remember as well, while I was giving that example, I remember as well, I went to an FX trader and there was a Western Union right next to it. And when I exited the FX trader, the man at the back of the line suddenly moved and he was walking behind me. Now, I looked from my peripheral, as I said, I'm very good at using that. 
And so I looked to the side and I realized this man was following me. And what I did, I just opened the door quickly because your sudden movement throws him off. So I just opened the door quickly and I ease back and allow him to go through the door. And he suddenly got confused. He started feeling his pockets as if he was looking for something and stuff like that. So your sudden movement, I think earlier in the presentation, I mentioned about um, giving yourself time and space to respond or to do something you're not, do not be predictable then, put it that way. So you allow yourself enough time and chance to do something else. All right. And so we have come to the end of this presentation. I don't know if there are any more questions um, in the chat or if persons are allowed to speak, you can and ask your questions. All right. Thank you very much, Detective Corporal Mullings. That was a very, very informative presentation. I learned so much from what you had to share with us this morning. Um, there was a, there was a, when you were talking about securing you, there was something that came up that I wanted to ask you about. You said, don't leave the primary crime scene. What about if there is a situation where you are being kidnapped? How, how would you handle that? Whether it is that you are taking a taxi for argument's sake or um, is a snatch and grab or um, you're going into your own vehicle and somebody decide to come in. How, how do you deal with that situation? Right, so as I said before, um, a kidnapping would be something more forceful and it usually involves um, some level of weapon or fear. And mm -hmm. so I wouldn't put kidnapping in the same scenario as somebody telling you to walk down that alley okay. or jumping into your car, for example. And if you notice that somebody is jumping in, into your car when you're getting in, you just jump out and alert persons around you instead of getting into the car with the person. You can pretend that you're gonna be obeying their commands and then you just run off. And sometimes too, we have to also be careful that we don't comply. Sometimes when you comply with their commands in terms of they're asking for your phone, don't hold on to the phone because the phone does not value your life. And so sometimes if you can give up that phone, you can buy another cell phone. Yes. So instead of resisting, you just give them what they want. Definitely. And most times they leave you alone. Yeah, definitely, you know, because sometimes some of us girls were really stubborn, you know, we'll say, boy, right. we just the phone and, you know, it's really not worth it. It's really, definitely. really not worth your life. Um, there's another question that I wanted to ask you and it just slipped my mind. So Sheena Brown, I am going to give you an opportunity. She asked to share an experience. So Sheena, we're unmuting your mic and then you can go ahead. Hi, good morning. All right, so let me try to be quick. Um, some time ago, a few years ago, actually, um, about two years ago, I went to uh, Mega Mart Waterloo at about 9 p.m. All right, so when I was pulling into the parking lot, I noticed a guy, like he pointed, you know, but I thought it was like, he was just trying to get my attention and whatnot. Anyway, I went into the, the supermarket and then I was in the cereal aisle. I was placing a call to my daughter because I didn't see the cereal, the exact cereal that she wanted, so I wanted another one from her. Anyway, um, I, I saw a gentleman approached me and said, um, you're, you're coming from, so he said, you're coming from all over pro direction. Your, your tire was on, your tire, when you turn the tire on fire, man. I said, fire? So him say, yeah, man, we need to look at it now and whatnot. But at the same time he was saying that, two other gentlemen were coming from the other side of the aisle. So I realized them coming one side, him on the other side, they would have kind of enclosed me. So I kind of stepped back and go behind the one who was speaking to me. So um, I think by that time when I said fire, um, the other two gentlemen were coming towards me. So 
um, one of them also laughed. So him, like he was still saying that we, we need to go look at it. I said, no, man, I can't ask my brother to look at it when, when I get home, he's a mechanic. You know, he would want to say that I might can't get home or whatnot. So anyway, I would say, anyway, however it go, it go, whatever. Anyway, they kind of got tired of me and walked away. But when I was approaching the cashier, they were there. And for the life of me, I, my heart was beating so fast. I was so afraid. So I kind of started lingering in the supermarket, not knowing what to do. And to be honest, I wasn't, I was afraid. I didn't even feel comfortable to go to a security. I, I, I just was not comfortable. I, so, I was just so afraid. I didn't know what to do. Anyway, I got, um, I gave them some time until I peeped again. I didn't see them. So I kind of went to the cashier. I was coming out. I wanted to say something to the security, but I was still so afraid. Um, I didn't, I went back in the car, I sat in there probably for about, about an hour, so I didn't have anybody to call, I didn't know what to do, I didn't say anything to anybody, what should I have done? Right, right. So you did right um, by lingering inside the supermarket to see what they're up to and then leaving at a time. As you said, you weren't comfortable at the time to speak with the security guard on duty there. But most times, if you actually speak to a security guard, just ask them to accompany you to your, your vehicle. At least most of these places, big agencies such as Megamart, they'll have security cameras so they can see where the security officer, you went to that person and you ask for some assistance to your vehicle or to check on your vehicle and then you leave and just beware of persons who are following you as well when you leave the supermarket as well as you could call the police to say that X, Y, Z is happening, you're uncomfortable and you're being told X and they'll send a unit. The police would I have called there? Would it have been 911-119? Definitely, because they will dispatch, they will dispatch the team that is close to your area. Okay. <laughs> no, I was telling her that it's once we are here, it's Always 119, it will Always never be 911. <laughs> right. But I the funny thing is, if you actually dial 911, you still get the local police here. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yes, you do. All right. Thank you so one much thing for sharing. Is, can I say one more thing? That's one, I think one thing, too, was that probably I was not sure if the securities knew them. They were part of right. it. So, um, and that's understandable. As also, it's important, ladies, to get to know local police officers in your area and know the direct number, the direct telephone number for the police station nearest to you, or at least a few of them, at least the one nearest to you and the head station for that police division. It's important to know those telephone numbers. And you can find these numbers as well on the Jamaica Constabulary Force website. Thank you so much for sharing that experience, um, Sheena. And I, I think I think it's very um, the first point that you shared, Detective Corporal Mullings, where we should be aware of our surroundings. That surroundings. is the first thing. That is the most yes. important thing. And sometimes we get a little bit panicky as women. I think right. you know if we try to keep a cool head, because if somebody walks up to you, you just turned off your car and you come out and somebody says, oh, your tire is on fire. Exactly, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. <laughs> Maybe you lit it. <laughs> you understand, so we have to try and keep cool, keep a right. cool head just to ensure that we, we don't put ourselves into situations that we could be harmed. Another Definitely. question, another quick question that I wanted to ask you, um, Detective Clark, because I know our time is going. Sure, there, are fine. there some simple tools that we could use for defense as women? So once I heard about the keys in between the two fingers. Yes, right? I was just about to say that. Right. Is there anything like that that you can share with us that we can use in defense of ourselves while we are? Well, the thing is that things you'd probably be able to use, they're not, um, they're not, pro there are prohibited items as it relates to Jamaican laws. So you're really not allowed to carry a pepper spray. You're really not allowed to carry a taser as a woman. And I, I think I would lobby for, for those laws to change because in this day and age, you really need something to protect yourselves. 
And as business women too, I'd encourage business women to get, I, I'm a shooter, so of course I'm gonna pr um, <laughs> promote, <laughs> I'm gonna promote firearms. Um, so I'd promote business women to become licensed firearm holders, you know? As long as you can keep a cool head, as long as you're security conscious as to how you carry your weapon, because I'll be wearing a dress and persons don't know that I have a firearm on me, for example, because this is something that should really take persons by surprise if you need to defend yourself. So I'd encourage persons to do that. But the key is a very, very major one. And also, if persons are able to enroll in defensive tactics class, that's self-defense classes, where you don't necessarily have to use a weapon to defend yourself. And don't try and go up against everything. Sometimes, as I said, you just need to comply and then you deal with everything else after. All right, great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Detective Corporal Mullings. This was indeed an excellent session. It was informative. There were lots of comments. There are lots of comments in the chat. So I know that the audience, small though we were in number, yes. we certainly benefited from your presentation this morning. So again, we want to say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you ladies for joining us as well. We have come to the end of our Women's Entrepreneur Series, but certainly you know we're coming with something else starting in the month of april something that is going to be um beneficial to you as business owners so again thank you for joining us remember our the session has been recorded and it will be available on the jbdc youtube channel so please join us again on the 5th of april which will be our next virtual biz zone Thank you again, Corp Detective Corporal Mullings, for joining Thank you so me. much for having me. Absolutely. Anytime. The face of the Jamaica yeah. Constabulary. Anytime. And a beautiful face indeed that is filled with information. So thank you for sharing with us and have a wonderful day, everyone.